This is the complete story of Grand Theft Auto so far. Let's begin. We first begin our story in 1961 in London, United Kingdom. You have the option of choosing from a variety of playable protagonists. The names are as follows. Charles Jones, Johnny Hawthorne, Maurice Kane, Mick Casey, Rodney Morash, Sid Vacant, Winston Henry, and Wolfie Villains. Your choice has no effect on the main story. It's just whoever you prefer to play as. The protagonist is only given 8 missions, since the video game is the second sequel prequel expansion pack for Grand Theft Auto. So I guess a sequel prequel prequel? The protagonist is given these missions to help Harold Cartwright of the Cartwright game. The missions are mainly taking out others who have wronged him in some way, such as a pill-pushing racer named Poundage Fern and getting evidence from people who are blackmailing Harold. In the end, we meet Harold Cartwright, who is pleased we helped him out. Listen, Mike, we've heard you all boy who can do his stuff, and by hookers and by crooks, you proved you ain't bad. Yeah, ain't bad at all, sunshine. Know what I mean? Eight years later in 1969, the chosen protagonist is still working with the Cartwright gang. We start with getting a scooter for Harold, who then trusts us in doing more jobs for the Chris twins, Archie and Albert, who are the head of the London mob. The mod gang has been giving the twins trouble, so it's up to the protagonist to end their drug dealers and cause havoc in the city. We then meet Jack Parkinson, who is pleased with our work. You're on the way to being a big face in this filthy cesspit. You done me a few favors, so I'm gonna do you a very big favor. We continue to complete jobs for the crime syndicate, such as kidnapping a posh man and ending a rival by blowing up a van filled with blow up dolls. What the f is going on now? Anyways, when we complete these sets of missions, we end up meeting the twins. Pretty little thing, ain't you? And we wanna keep you like that. Archie and Albert are having problems and need to mend a few broken pipes. This includes taking out a football team that Albert has placed a bet against and rescuing one of their call girls from a rival pimp and taking him out. One of the main missions in this set is ending Harold Cartwright. Albert is convinced that he's stolen Albert's personal supply of drugs and disappeared. The protagonist asks Cypress Phil and Harold's sister Beryl where he is. They'll both deny where he is and Albert orders us to finish them off. Archie then informs us that Harold is going to leave London and is in a green mini in Hyde Park. After the protagonist ends Harold, they they go to his flat to find his car, which Albert believes his drugs are in. After taking it back to their garage, it's discovered that the drugs were not in the car or in Harold's flat, which means that Albert was wrong all along. Albert doesn't care though as he thought of Harold as a useless prat anyway. After a few more missions, the protagonist gets a telegram from Jack Parkinson, stating that the Crisp twins think the protagonist is going to take them out and are going to leave London. The protagonist tracks them down and blows up their car. The twins survive however, and they tell the protagonist that they're leaving London so he won't come at them with a bleeding A-bomb again. Arch is off to Devon. And I'm leaving the country, heading for Thailand, actually. Very posh. Fifteen years later, in 1984, we find Victor Vic Vance, a U.S. Army soldier under the command of Sergeant Jerry Martinez. Jerry pressures Vic into drug trafficking for him since he doesn't want to get caught himself. Vic is strongly against this, but he agrees since he needs money for his brother's asthma medicine. After doing a couple of jobs for Jerry and meeting a new friend, Phil Cassidy, who is also in debt with him, Vic is then sent to pick up a call girl and bring her back to the base. Vic is caught by his master sergeant, however. Hey, buddy. Listen, I charge more for group. Along with Jerry's marijuana, which Vic hid in the best hiding spot he could think of, his bed. Vic is dishonorably discharged, leaving him in the streets with nothing but a pocket full of sunshine. He does some work for Phil and eventually meets his brother-in-law, Marty J. Williams, who Vic witnesses abusing his wife Louise and Mary Beth. Marty uses Vic to solidify his gang as a threat. As Vic does jobs for Marty, he is also seeing Louise on the side, which upsets Marty and in turn has Louise and Mary Beth leave to her sister's house. After Vic gets her stuff back from Marty's, he kidnaps Louise and Mary Beth, causing Vic to chase him down and put an end to him, giving him full control of Marty's trailer park gang, now going by the Vance gang. After this, Vic gets a page that a family member is coming to town to help him out. To his dismay, it's his brother Lance, who he sees as a slacker and unreliable. After some arguing, Vic and Lance leave, but are soon confronted by the Cholos, threatening to kill Vic. Lance takes the wheel as Vic shoots down Cholos and eventually VC police officers. They manage to escape to Lance's hotel, which he's charging Vic for. Vic eventually rises his gang in businesses, but an undercover cop named Brian Forbes tries to get the Vance brothers killed or arrested. Lance figures this out and threatens to kill Forrest. You're a freaking cop! You think you can mess with Lance T. Vance? But he runs and the brothers are forced to chase him down. When they do, they tie him up and take him to a warehouse in Little Haiti to extract information. After being sent into two ambushes, Victor and Lance head back to the warehouse to end Forbes. He managed to escape, but the pair chase him down and finally end him. Along the way to rising his criminal empire, Victor gets wind from Vance that Jerry has a shipment of drunks coming in soon. Thinking this is the perfect revenge, Victor and Lance head to the dock, kill Martinez's men, and steal the coke. Unfortunately, Victor is informed by Jerry that the coke actually belonged to the Mendez brothers. Now, we're all on their list, and the only way off is in a 
Pie. The Mendez brothers find out it was them that stole it, but they try to shift the blame to Jerry Martinez instead, insinuating that he's actually an undercover cop. To prove this, the Vance brothers combine Forbes' file with Martinez's and get a picture of him meeting a DEA agent. To get back on the Mendez brothers' good side, Vic does a few jobs for them, like killing competing drug runners. Lance later informs Vic that someone has been getting into their stash. He accuses others, but it's actually him and Louise. This is the Lance Vance dance. You got to, uh, all right, pop it and uh, lock it, yeah. Vic gets the wrong idea about Lance and Louise being together, which causes Louise to leave Vic and Lance to throw away the coke in the ocean, but Vic is able to recover the packages. Vic then gets a call that Louise is being followed by Martinez's men. After finding her, he takes her to the hospital to recover. Vic later meets Phil Collins through Rennie Vasselmeyer, a radio host and regular buyer. Phil is being hunted by the Ferrelli family because his manager, Barry, borrowed $3 million from them. Vic is able to save him and save his concert that Phil later puts on. Vic then meets drug kingpin Ricardo Diaz, who needs him to steal a boat from Gonzalez, a drug dealer who's cutting out Diaz, and is later double-crossed when doing a deal with the DEA. The Mendez brothers decide that the Vance brothers are free to go, as long as they leave Vice City. Vic disagrees and the pair are knocked out by Mendez goons and taken to the airport fuel depot beside three gas tankers. More Mendez goons attack, but Vic and Lance are able to escape and sever ties with the Mendez brothers. They then try to attack Vic's assets, but he, along with Phil Cassidy and Umberto Rubina, are able to protect them. You grown any cojones yet, lady boy? Yo, bro! <laughs> Come here, Vic. Vic retaliates by hacking into the Mendez brothers' house robot to destroy the contents of their safe, leaving them broke. The Masterbot! You lousy piece of crap! You've ruined me! Do you require a light? Vic picks up Louise from the hospital and is able to rekindle the relationship. The next time he visits her, he finds out she's been kidnapped by Armando Diaz. Victor and Lance storm the Mendez mansion and separate to find Louise. Vic finds Armando who informs him that Lance and Louise are dead. Vic kills Armando and goes upstairs to find Lance and Louise. Lance is unconscious, but Louise succumbs to her injuries and her baby left to the care of her sister. We could have had something special. Yeah. <laughs> we did have something special. A despaired Vic then leaves to steal an attack chopper from his former army base to assault a building that Diego Mendez is hiding. After some time of shooting down the goons, one of them shoots down Vic's helicopter. After clearing everyone out, Jerry shows up along with Diego. After a final firefight, Lance shows up in a helicopter but it's too late to join in the fight. He then tells Vic that he can get a hold of more coke to sell, but Vic wants them both to swear off the stuff as Lance agrees. They then ride off in the helicopter, returning home to provide their brother with the money for his medicine. Two years later, a new up-and-coming criminal flies to Vice City. Tommy Versetti is sent there by his boss, Sonny Ferrelli, after serving 15 years in prison for committing 11 counts of murder in Liberty City. During the trial, Tommy is given the name the Harwood Butcher by the media and news outlets. Worried that Tommy's presence will strike fear in the streets once again, Sonny thinks it's best for Tommy to start selling drugs and building a few assets in Vice City while he takes a slice of the profits. Tommy and his two bodyguards, Harry and Lee, meet with the family lawyer, Ken Rosenberg, at the airport in Vice City. They are to meet with two brothers at the docks for a deal exchange. When they arrive, the helicopter flies in, revealing the brothers to be Lance and Victor, showing that they did indeed get back into the drug business. As the deal goes down, masked men ambush them and end up killing Harry, Lee, and Victor. Tommy leaves the drugs and money and jumps into Ken's car as Lance flies off in his helicopter. Ken drives back to his office and goes inside as Tommy drives to his hotel to tell Sonny the horrible news. Look, Sonny, we were set up. The deal was an ambush. Harry and Lee are dead. You better be kidding me, Tommy! Tell me you still got the money. No, Sonny. I don't have the money. Sonny is furious, but Tommy promises he'll get the drugs, money, and find out who is responsible. Sonny gives him a chance, but with a fair warning. If it was anybody else, you'd be dead already. But because it's you, because we got history, I'm gonna let you handle this. Tommy heads back to Ken, who knows of someone who might have knowledge of the deal. Tommy heads to the Malibu Club to meet Kent Paul, who, with some persuading, gives info of a chef who's been looking pleased with himself. Tommy confronts the chef, beats him down, and takes his cell phone. Lance Vance then shows up and wants to work with Tommy to find their stuff. Tommy was reluctant at first, but eventually agrees. Tommy also meets a retired colonel, Juan Cortez, who helps set up the deal to have him make some inquiries about what happened. Tommy also meets real estate mogul, Every Carrington, and helps with his own projects. As Tommy helps Cortez, he eventually suspects that drug baron Ricardo Diaz is responsible for the ambush, but is not sure yet. Tommy is then sent as protection for a deal that Diaz is conducting and brings Lance along to see if he's of any use. The deal is ultimately destructed by the Haitians, but Tommy and Lance are able to take them out and recover the money they tried to steal, giving Tommy a foot in the door. Tommy and Lance do a few jobs for Diaz and eventually find out he in fact set up an ambush. Lance is eager to kill Diaz, but Tommy wants to wait as he believes the more they learn now, the less they have to find out when they take over the city. But Lance didn't listen and gets himself kidnapped and tortured by Diaz's men in a junkyard. 
Tommy infiltrates the junkyard, saves Lance, and takes him to the hospital to recover. Once Lance is ready, he meets Tommy outside of Diaz's mansion, and the pair lead an assault, ending Diaz and making Tommy the new kingpin of Vice City. Say goodnight, Mr. Tommy then meets many residents around Vice City, such as Umberto Rubina, head of the Cuban gang. Like my brother. Like my son. I think I prefer the cash to being bounced on your knee, amigo. Auntie Paulette, who uses her voodoo juju to get Tommy to do jobs for the Haitian gang. Them calling your name, boy. Must want you pretty bad, don't you think? Rock band Love Fist, who's having problems with a psychotic stalker and a speed-related car bomb. <laughs> And Phil Cassidy, who ends up blowing his arm off with a homemade boomshine bomb. Ta -da! Oh, damn! <laughs> Tommy also buys various assets, and they are as follows <gasps> a boat yard for cocaine shipments, cherry popper ice cream factory that fronts as a drug distributor, Kaufman cabs that Tommy takes out their competition, Sunshine Autos to sell stolen vehicles, Interglobal Film Studios to film and sell XXX movies, the Malibu Club where Tommy uses the upstairs to plan and successfully pull off a bank robbery, the Pole Position Club that's, well, it's just a gentleman's club, and print works that is used to print counterfeit money. Whew. Sonny gets wind of Tommy's success and is upset that he hasn't kicked up any money. Sonny then sends goons to steal from Tommy's assets, but Tommy is able to protect them and consequently severs ties with Sonny. When Tommy returns to his mansion, Ken and Lance tell him that Sonny is coming down to look at the business. Tommy is ready to stand his ground and tells Ken to get 20 million or 3 million, a, a briefcase full of counterfeit cash to get Sonny off his back. When Sonny arrives, he begins to annoy Tommy who tries to give Sonny the cash, but then a shocking, but I've seen that coming, secret is revealed. Sorry Tommy, this is Vice City. This is business. <laughs> Tommy then begins a firefight with Sonny's goons and eventually chases Lance Vance to the roof for his last dance. Tommy returns to the foyer where Sonny reveals it was him that set up Tommy and Harwood 15 years ago for the fear that Tommy's rising power will cause him problems within his own family. Tommy and Sonny exchange bullets but Tommy is the victor. Ken then runs out of his hiding spot and Tommy reveals that there is no out north anymore but now it's all down south making him the main crime boss of Vice City. Just one year later, there's news from Los Santos San Andreas. Carl Johnson and his brother Brian were rumored to be in a rival gang's territory. The rival gang noticed and opened fire on them, but Brian was the one that was hit. Brian was critically injured, but Carl did nothing and watched his brother die. Ever since then, their older brother Sean, nicknamed Sweet, blamed Carl for Brian's death. Unable to cope with this, Carl left Los Santos and headed to Liberty City, where he worked for Joey Leone's chop shop, stealing vehicles that Joey wanted, as well as petty street theft. During this time, Tommy sends Ken Rosenberg to a drug rehabilitation clinic in Carson City, San Andreas, after being clouded by cocaine. In 1992, Ken completes his rehabilitation and tries to get a hold of Tommy, but Tommy shuns out Ken, not wanting anything to do with him, and Ken left out of a job. Look, I made that ingrate, and now he won't take my calls? Just put him on the phone right now! Hello? Hello? At the same time, Sweet and his gang, Grove Street families, are losing control and respect in the streets. His second in command, Big Smoke, encourages Sweet to start selling drugs to rebuild their control and make more money. Sweet ignores him as he wants to stick by his morals and not destroy his gang. Man, I thought we was in this for the hood. Not destroying the family, man. This Grove Street. A few days later, a green saber rolls into Grove Street, where Sweet, his sister Kendall, and their mother Beverly reside. A drive-by on Sweet's house ensues as they think that Sweet is inside, but he was actually at another house nearby. Unfortunately, their mother was inside and killed. Kendall and Sweet mourn outside of the Johnson house as he makes a call to CJ. I think you better come home. It's about mama. She's dead, bro. CJ then takes a flight back home to bury his mom, but upon arriving, he is stopped by Crash, Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums. Officer Frank Tempenny pulls over the cab that CJ is in and takes whatever money he has in his pocket. They put him in the back of the cruiser and notify him that another officer, Ralph Pendleberry, had just been killed and threatened to frame him, unless he does what they say when they say it. They throw him out of the car into Ballas territory for a GSF's sworn enemy. Ah, oh, Here we go again. CJ rides a bicycle back to Grove Street and enters his mom's house. The realization finally hits him that his mom is gone and he sits at a table looking at the picture of Beverly. Big Smoke storms in with a bat at the ready, thinking CJ is an intruder. You picked the wrong house, fool! But he recognizes CJ, embraces him, and promises he'll find out who is responsible for Beverly's death. They take a ride to the cemetery where his mother is being buried, where they meet up with Sweet, Kendall, and Ryder who is another lifelong friend. Sweet gives CJ the cold shoulder for running off before, which causes Kendall to leave to see her boyfriend Caesar. Sweet explains to CJ what's been going wrong. Everybody blasts on food first, then ask questions second. 
As the four men leave, a ballast car shows up and attempts to drive by, but they end up blowing up Smoke's car instead. They grab some bikes and give the ballast the slip back to Grove Street. CJ informs Sweet that he thinks of staying in town to help out the gang. CJ does a few tasks to get the Grove's name back in the street, such as tagging up ballast turf and doing drive-bys on them. CJ also learns of Sweet's dismay towards Kendall's boyfriend since he's from a different neighborhood. So CJ enters a lowrider competition to check on his sister, and after meeting Caesar, he starts to warm up to him. Smoke asks CJ's help to rebuild the gang again, but for some reason, all he does is pick up an old friend getting out of prison, Jeffrey. It's OG Loke, homie! OG Loke! I mean, OG Loke. And help him escape some Russian mafia goons. But anyway, CJ does help OG Loke get his rap career off the ground by stealing a sound system and Mad Dog's rhyme book. Crash eventually gets a hold of CJ to take out some Vagos and Russian dealers that are getting in Tenpenny's way. They still aren't done with CJ, but more on that later. Now that GSF are feared once again, a gang war is to be held under the Mulholland intersection. As CJ leaves to head there, he gets a call from Caesar. CJ meets Caesar across the street from a garage, but what he sees shocks him. What the f***? CJ rushes to Sweet for fear he's heading to a trap. Upon arriving, Sweet sustains a bullet wound, but CJ and GSF are able to take out the ballas. Unfortunately, police arrive and arrest the Johnson brothers. CJ is revealed to be taken by Crash to the middle of nowhere, and his brother is taken to a prison hospital to treat his bullet wounds. Crash continues to threaten him, only this time it will be his brother who suffers if CJ disobeys him. CJ gets help from Caesar's cousin, Catalina, to earn some money. They rob a few places around Weststone County and develop a relationship. Only CJ sees how crazy Catalina is, so they break it off after their last robbery. CJ also meets a hippie marijuana grower named The Truth who supplies Tenpenny with drugs and Woozy Moo, also known as Woozy, during a street race. At CJ's next race, however, Catalina shows up and tries to trash his car. She claims her love for another man named Claude and they engage in a race against CJ. He's able to beat them, but instead of cash or a pink slip, he is given the deed to a garage in San Fierro since Claude needs his car for him and Catalina to travel to Liberty City. CJ then gets a call from The Truth that the marijuana Tenpenny needed is ready, but when he arrives at The Truth farm, a police helicopter shows up, leaving the pair no choice but to burn up the truce marijuana crops. They then head to CJ's new garage in San Fierro, which is not as good as CJ thought it would be. Kendall tries to encourage CJ to make the garage into a place of business, so he gathers up some of the truce friends, Jethro and Wade, who are the ones who previously owned the boatyard in Vice City that Tommy purchased, and Zero, who is a tech professional, and starts to make the garage into a chop shop. CJ later gets a call from Tenpenny to take out a reporter who's been interfering with his work, and uses the weed he wanted to frame a district attorney. He then gets back into contact with Woozy, who is trying to get rid of a rival triad gang, the Da Nang Boys. During all of this, Caesar and CJ take photos of associates working for Big Smoke, who are a writer, Jizzy B, a local pimp, Tebow Mendez, who works as Strong Arm Muscle, and Mike Torino. Not much is known about him though. The name of their crew is known as the Loco Syndicate. CJ does some work for Jizzy to try to get close to him, and eventually infiltrates his pimp palace and takes him out to steal his phone. He uses it to get the location of a meetup with the rest of the members of the Syndicate at Pier 69. When taking out the protection, Torino flies in and knows is the bodies, causing everyone to run out. CJ guns down T-Bone at the end of the pier and chases Ryder on a boat and takes him out. Hey, Ryder, Sherm here, that Where you think you going? Can't stop me. CJ gets info on Torino's whereabouts and blows up his helicopter, seemingly killing him in a ball of fire, as well as blowing up their crack factory, ceasing any production for Big Smoke. He then gets a call from a mysterious man, telling him to meet him at his ranch in Tierra Robata. What it look like I'm made of, Putin? After proving his monster truck skills, CJ finds out the man is Mike Torino. Torino explains that he works for a government agency and that he can help Sweet get out of prison early if CJ helps him. He orders CJ to buy a hangar in the desert and learn how to fly. Once he does, he helps Torino with problems he's having with the rival agency. CJ then gets a call from Woozy to meet him at his newly acquired casino. CJ and Woozy find out from Johnny Sindaco after scaring him that his family and the Leones are trying to sabotage the Four Dragons since they are one third of the owner of Caligula's Casino. CJ then rescues Kent Paul, now a music producer, and Macker from the desert. He takes them back to Caligula's where Ken Rosenberg is now running the casino under the strict and frightening orders of Salvatore Leone. Rosenberg, however, needs to meet Johnny Sindaco, who CJ had put in the hospital after scaring him. Johnny recognizes him though and has a heart attack, causing Rosenberg Rosenberg and CJ to fight through the goons and escape, which gives Rosenberg some flashbacks. This is so exciting, Tommy. It's like old times. Who the f is Tom? CJ then has to fake the deaths of Rosenberg, Kent, and Macker so they can escape from Salvatore's wrath. During all of this, CJ and Woozy plan and rob Caligulus' vault, which leads Salvatore to threaten CJ if he finds him again. Your friends are dead. Your family's dead. Well, it's been nice talking to you, but uh, I got some money that needs spending on some expensive trash. 
so if you excuse me. You're dead! CJ then gets a call from Crash to find an FBI agent that has a dossier filled with Tenpenny's corruption. When he finds it, he meets Tenpenny in a ghost town in the desert. Surprisingly, Tenpenny knocks out Officer Jimmy Hernandez because he's been snitching on Tenpenny about his various crime activities. Tenpenny has his partner, Officer Eddie Pulaski, stay and have CJ dig a hole enough for him and Hernandez. Hernandez then wakes up and tries to attack Pulaski, but is shot and thrown in the grave. CJ gives chase to Pulaski and ends him, now only leaving Tenpenny, the only Crash member left. Earlier, while helping Woozy in his casino, CJ saves Fallen Off rapper Mad Dog from, well, falling off a roof after new rapper OG Loke is doing far more successful than he is. When he gets out of the hospital, he visits CJ and asks for help to take back his mansion from drug dealer Big Papa. CJ helps Mad Dog get back on his feet after getting his rhyme book back from OG Loke and getting him to stop stealing his rhymes. Torino gets a hold of CJ to ask for one more job, and afterwards, sticks to his word and gets Sweet out of prison early. When CJ goes to pick him up, he tells Sweet all about his success he's had. All Sweet wants to do is get back to the Grove and check on the gang. He berates CJ for having forgotten about Grove Street and compares him to Big Smoke. That's everybody's dream to get out the hood. Man, you sound just like Smoke right now. Which causes him to give in and take his brother back to Grove Street. When they get there, they find that everyone, including the gang, has succumbed to drugs. CJ and Sweet work together to take out drug dealers and take Gan back from the ballas. CJ later visits Sweet at his house where he almost starts doing drugs by peer pressure from one of Beat Up's crack wars. The brothers then go to find Beat Up, but he's moved to Glen Park, Ballas territory. They take over Glen Park and confront Beat Up, where he tries to have his former GSF member, now corrupted by crack, Big Bear, fight Sweet and CJ. But Big Bear has had enough and punches Beat Up and begs CJ and Sweet to bring him back in the gang. CJ, his siblings, and his friends are then watching the trial of Frank Tenpenny for his corruption. However, the verdict comes back as not guilty. The district attorney's office has seen fit to drop all charges what? against this innocent man. Causing a full riot in the streets. CJ then gets gets back to Grove Street with Sweet to lock down the hood. CJ later helps Caesar and his gang, the Barrios Los Aztecas, reclaim their territory back from the Vagos. Once CJ takes over more territories, they finally get information on Big Smoke's whereabouts and see to him. CJ infiltrates his crack house factory and confronts Big Smoke. He thinks he's untouchable, but CJ proves him wrong. Big Smoke admits he did it all for money and power as he succumbs to his injuries. Tenpenny then has CJ at gunpoint and has him fill the suitcase with Smoke's cash. He tells CJ he's got a plane to catch and is about to shoot CJ, but is able to distract Tenpenny Penny as he makes an escape. When CJ gets outside, Sweet jumps on the fire truck that Tenpenny is escaping on. CJ gives chase, saves Sweet, and Tenpenny loses control of the fire truck, causing him to fly over the bridge in Grove Street. He gets out and exclaims that if there were more people like him, then the city would be safe as he lays in the street dying. The crew talks about smoke and his selfishness, and CJ gets the last word. See you around, officer. Everyone then meets at the Johnson house trying to figure out what to do next as Mad Dog and his new lawyer, Rosenberg, display his first gold record. CJ then heads for the door to check out the hood. Finna hit the block. See what's happening. Now in 1997, we mirrored a variety of protagonists to choose from again. Bubba, Divine, Katie, Kivlov, Mickey, Travis, Troy, or Ulrika. The protagonist is first in Liberty City as the hired goon for the Vercotti crime family, assisting them in various crimes, but mainly as a driver and taking out members of the rival Sanetti gang. The protagonist then meets Bubby Vercotti at his office where they're told that cops are trying to look for them, so Bubby books them a flight to San Andreas. The cops are crawling up my ass with flashlights looking for you. I hooked your flight to San Andreas where they start working for Uncle Fu to expand his Chinese crime syndicate across the city. We extort money in the tradition of our ancestors. You honor our family. You have our gratitude. After Uncle Fu thanks the protagonist, they start to work for Alboro, the leader of a Mexican gang. Alboro needs help in various crime activities and taking out a few traitors. Alboro thanks them, but in a more physical way. Now it's time for you to find out why they call me the donkey, huh? Ha <laughs> I'm gonna reward you personally this time! The protagonist decides to move to Vice City where they are confronted by Samuel Deaver, a corrupt Vice Squad officer who threatens them to do his dirty work since he claims to have evidence of the protagonist's previous crimes. I hear you're working behind my back. If that's true, I'm gonna fuck you like a crazy bitch. Get the out of my sight. They are forced to help Deaver start a gang war against the Rastas, a Jamaican gang that has been waging terror for seven years. The Rastas leader, Brother Marcus, is able to convince the protagonist to join forces and is given protection against Deaver and his squad. They eventually take out Samuel Deaver and his vice agents. Afterwards, the protagonist meets with Brother Marcus and collect their retirement money, seemingly ending their career as a criminal. Serious cashing of these days, huh? So, uh, I don't think I'll be seeing you for a long time. 
Just one year later, back in Liberty City, Tony Cipriani comes back to the city and to the Leone crime family after having to lay low for four years for killing a main man from a rival gang. Tony meets up with his boss, Salvatore Leone, who is now back from San Andreas and his gang is now the least feared in the city. Tony is introduced to Vincenzo Chili, the family's capo. He is reluctant to take orders from Vinny, but Sal makes him see otherwise. You walk in here and start to question my leadership right away is, quite frankly, out of order. Kabish. Vinny takes Tony to his new place, get a change of clothes, and has Tony take him to his warehouse in Atlantic Keys. Tony is persuaded to work for Vinny, taking out some Daco goons. On his last job for Vinny, Tony is sent to pick up a car which is being washed by the cops. Tony escapes them and calls Vinny, who thinks Tony is ungrateful. Screw the police for watching the car! Screw the police! When I tell you to do something, you do it! Capiche? As a final act of revenge, Tony takes the car to the crusher and severs ties with Vinny. Tony then works for JD O'Toole, a Sendaku gang member who now wants to join up with the Leone gang, since he's not moving up the ranks due to him not being fully Italian. Tony is able to take out Sendaku gangsters, and JD later has the opportunity to become a made man. Tony, JD, and a Leone enforcer named Mickey drive to the junkyard to meet with Sal, but JD is then shot in the back of the head by Mickey. He screwed over his own boss! This scratch yard. Salvatore could never trust that mother So Tony then drives Mickey home and dumps the car in the ocean. When Tony visits his ma, she berates him for not calling her when he was away and gives him every reason she can see why he's not a good son. Tony desperately tries to please his ma, but to no satisfaction. She's so fed up with him that she actually puts a hit on her son and for him to at least try to die like a real man. I called a hit on you. It's really the only way you. What? Ah. He's able to take out the hitman, but every so often a couple more would show up to try to take him out. Tony soon helps Sal with his fight with Jane Hopper, the leader of the striking dock workers. She's now allowing Sal to use the docks to sell drugs out of the city, even though Sal is the one who set up the strikes. Sal tries to give her money and the dock workers some, uh, ladies, but this doesn't soften her up. Tony then scares her to agreement by driving recklessly in her limo. During all this, Tony is also taking care of Sal's girl, Maria. Maria is a real pain in the ass, getting herself in trouble with the law and her biker boyfriend. I'm telling I don't have anything hidden up there. Get the hell off of me. She also suffers from a drug overdose, but Tony is able to help her with a zap and she somehow turns it into him hitting on her when he doesn't have any money. Well, what the hell have you been coming on to me for? I'm Salvatore's girl. Tony then gets a call from Vinny, who wants to patch things up with him for Sal. Tony meets Vinny on a freighter to help unload a shipment, but it was all a setup. After taking out the goons, Tony confronts Vinny and finally takes him out. Sal and Tony then have to escape to Portland due to Mayor Roger C. Hull, blaming Sal for every crime in the city. Now in Staten Island, Sal and Tony assassinate the mayor to take his cell phone. Tony is then called to a meeting, being picked up by Mickey. Tony is nervous since it seems like he's going to get whacked. Sal then shows up and announces it's time for Tony to become a made man. Afterwards, Tony's mom calls him and is proud of her son and ultimately calls off the hit. I never doubted you for a second, son. Tony then meets Donald Love, a mayoral candidate to replace Hull. Tony helps him with his mayoral campaign by killing his rival, O'Donovan's campaigners, and burning down a Ferrelli warehouse of voting machines and fake ballots. O'Donovan dresses in his daughter's underwear. Despite having a huge lead, Donald loses due to the news of his affiliation with the Leones and has now gone bankrupt, blaming Tony for it all. Tony then gets a call from Leon McCaffrey, who he helped wage war with the Ferrellis and the Yardies. He says that Sal has been jailed and he's cutting off ties so nothing can be tracked back to him. He isn't sure if it's the Ferrellis or Sundakos that ratted him out, so he wants Tony to hit them both. He exacts revenge on the Ferrellis and takes out Pauly Sundako. Ladies and gentlemen, Pauly Sundako has left the building. Donald reaches out to Tony for help to become rich again. Tony takes out his mentor, Every Carrington, and Ned Burner, who posed as a reverend and employed Tony. Donald then celebrates that he is going to be rich again. He requests a special party with the corpses of Avery and Ned as guests. Donald also needs Tony to clear up a part of Fort Stalin to seal the deal for Panlantic. He visits Abel Autos for some explosives and successfully plants them, destroying Fort Stanton. Unfortunately, the Colombian cartel are trying to kill Donald unless he keeps his mouth shut and pays them off. Tony is able to take out the cartel members and take Donald to the airport, escaping with Avery and Ned on board. Sal is going to court for his crimes, but the Sicilian Mafia are trying to kill him. Tony has to protect the prison transport on the way to the courthouse from the Mafia members. Sal is then found not guilty and heads back to his house. When Tony heads to Sal's house, he's on the phone with a Sicilian mob who wants peace, but Sal refuses. The pair then head to the mayor's office to persuade him to drop the charges he has on Sal, but they realize that the Sicilians have already taken him to a lighthouse on Portland Rock. They take a boat to the lighthouse and confront Massimo Torini. Tony and Sal take out Torini by taking out the helicopter he tried to escape on. Now back at Sal's, the mayor drops the charges with some persuasion by Tony. Sal then meets with his uncle at Mama's restaurant, who admits defeat to try to take out Sal and quietly returns back to Sicily, but not before uttering that every dog has his day. Sal thinks Tony but only gives him half of the million dollars he promised, simply because you can never put a price on friendship. The kind of friendship you and me have, 
Shame on you. Now in 1999 or 2013, depending on who you believe, but I prefer 1999, Claude Speed is a criminal in anywhere city. Yes, that's the name of the actual city. The city is divided into three districts, downtown, residential, and industrial. And in each district, there are three gangs for a total of seven gangs, only because in each district, the Zaibatsu is present. The goal is for Speed to earn enough money to leave town. In each district, he'll earn respect or hatred completing jobs, which consists of taking out their rivals or causing mayhem in the city. He finishes each district with the bosses of the three gangs in each certain district gunning for speed and he ultimately takes them out and moves on to the next district. The ending is just like the others, kill the three main bosses of the industrial or be killed yourself. He finally ends the bosses of the Krishna, Zaibatsu, and Russian Mafia. After this, the city evolves into total chaos. Speed then has to go to Jesus Saves Church and only if he has accumulated five million dollars, thus ending his life of crime and getting out of anywhere city. Job complete! Another year later in 2000 in Liberty City, a local criminal named Mike and his partner Vinny work together to earn enough money to leave the city. Vinny has Mike finish up a couple of things before they are ready to leave town. After this, Mike is to meet Vinny at Callahan Point. When he gets there, he witnesses Vinny's car explode ending Vinny and the money that was in it. Mike then escapes the responding police officers and heads to 8-Ball's garage who says he'll investigate Vinny's death and page Mike when he finds something. Mike helps out 8-Ball before suggesting that he starts working for a bartender named Johnny, who is also connected to the criminal underworld. Johnny also inquires about Vinny's death, while Mike does some jobs for him including beating up a senator who is trying to ban smoking in bars. Mike starts to get annoyed by Johnny's paranoia that someone is out to get him, but it later proves true when he's killed while Mike is out on a job for him. Mike notices that the killers are from the Uptown Yardies gang and he falls follows them to the Staten Island and confronts their boss King Courtney. King Courtney claims he had nothing to do with it since Johnny owed him money and is trying to find the right killer. After helping the Yardies, Mike figures out that they were just using him. King Courtney pointed the finger at Cisco, the leader of the Colombian cartel, as Johnny's killer. Cisco warns Mike of Courtney's treachery and starts working for him instead. On one mission, Mike is sent to kidnap Yuka Kassin, the niece of Asuka, the Yakuza leader. He is then employed by the Yakuza who hire him to get Asuka's niece back unbeknownst that he was the kidnapper. He agrees but only if Asuka helps him find Vinny killer, which she agrees as well. Mike is then working for the Colombian cartel and the Yakuza at the same time, fueling the gang war between them but is only in it to find Vinny's killer. However, Mike visits Cisco's plane and sees that he's been killed. He then sees the same car that left Johnny's crime scene speed away, assuming that the person killed Johnny and Vinny. Mike eventually crashes the car out of commission and the driver is revealed to be Vinny himself. Vinny reveals that he was conspiring against Mike the whole time, trying to fake his death and keep the money for himself. Mike and Vinny and his bodyguards engage in a firefight, but Vinny ends up wounded. He pleads for his life and tries to convince Mike that if he kills him, then any greedy criminal will come after him. Mike doesn't care though and ends up killing Vinny anyway. He then meets up with 8-Ball and Pike Creek when the Colombian cartel ambushed them, thinking that Mike was the one that killed Cisco. Mike is able to fend them off enough to escape, but 8-Ball is injured by a broken leg and burned hands and is arrested by the LCPD. Mike goes after the Colombian cartel boss to find out who is after him, which he finds out is King Courtney. He then gets word from Asuka that Courtney is hiding in a warehouse in Cedar Grove. King Courtney sends waves of his men at Mike, but he's able to withstand everything that's being thrown at him. King Courtney admits defeat and Mike is now able to leave Liberty City with the money. Police are surrounding him however, so Mike uses a tank to race to the airport in order to get to Cisco's plane and fly off. Mike is able to make it to the plane as he remembers his fallen friends as it takes off seemingly headed to Columbia. In 2001, Claude and Catalina reach Liberty City to continue their crime spree. One day, them and a couple of assailants rob a bank, but on the way out, Catalina shoots one of their partners and Claude. Sorry babe, I'm an ambitious girl. <laughs> Small time. She then escapes with her driver Miguel, leaving Claude to be arrested. While in a prison transport, members of the Colombian cartel ambush the convoy to take an elderly oriental man, giving the chance for Claude to escape as well as 8-Ball, now with bandaged hands. Before they can make it off the bridge, an explosion goes off destroying it. Claude drives 8-Ball to a safe house for a change of clothes and then meet Luigi at his club in the red light district. Claude helps Luigi with his girls and is eventually introduced to Joey Leone, the son of Don Salvatore Leone, and the same Joey that CJ worked for almost 10 years ago. After doing a few jobs for Joey, Claude then meets the Don's capo, Tony Cipriani, now more overweight and resembling more of a soprano than a Cipriani. Now that Claude has met and helped the Leone family, he meets Sal, who is impressed by his work and contribution to the family. I see nothing but good things for you, my boy. Sal is paranoid that there is a rat in the family because the Colombian cartel always know what he's planning. Claude follows a suspected snitch and it proves true when he meets with Catalina and Miguel to discuss Leone politics. Sal then has Claude and 8-Ball blow up their ship that contains Spank, the drug that the cartel has been selling. During all this, Claude also meets Sal's girl Maria, who feels an attraction towards Claude, but Claude shows no affection. Well, he doesn't show any emotion at all. Sal then says Claude on one last job to dispose of a car with a certain red interior. We had to help some guy make up his mind and improve a little. Uh, messy. 
On the way to the car's location, Maria pages Claude that it's actually a setup and to meet her at the jetty in Callahan Point. She explains to Claude that she told Sal that her and Claude are seeing each other, which sends his paranoia through the roof. It's all my fault because I told him we were an item. Don't ask me what, I don't know. Her friend, Asuka Kassin, shows up to get them to Stalin Island and away from the Leones. Asuka tasks Claude with assassinating Sal to prove that his ties with the Mafia are truly severed. Claude does so and starts working for the Yakuza, as well as her brother Kenji, leader of the gang. Claude meets Donald Love, now back in Liberty City, and rich again. He sends Claude to save the old Oriental man that the cartel kidnapped in the beginning, and to kill Kenji Kassin, but to make it look like the Colombian cartel was responsible. Claude then goes to a construction site to get a package for Donald, but he comes face to face with Catalina and Miguel. Catalina shoots Miguel and escapes by jumping off the roof. You always got a choice, you dumb bastard. Asuka keeps Miguel tied up to get information of the Colombian cartel's business dealings and have Claude destroy their spank distribution. Claude later goes back to the construction site but finds Asuka and Miguel dead and a ransom note left by Catalina, instructing him to bring $500,000 to the villa in Cedar Grove if he wants Maria back. When Claude gets there, Catalina betrays him once again. Well, I got news for you. Shooting you will be a pleasure, but dating you was only business. But you haven't learned. I'm not to be trusted. Kill the idiot! But Claude is able to take out Catalina's goons. She tries to escape to the dam by helicopter, but Claude shoots it down with the rocket launcher, finally ending Catalina. As Claude and Maria walk out of the dam, Maria is heard complaining about her hair and clothes when a gunshot cuts her off, seemingly that Claude shot Maria due to her annoyance. My fucking nail and my hair is ruined! I mean, can you believe it? This one cost me 50 dollars Elsewhere in North Yankton, Michael Townley, Trevor Phillips, and Brad Snyder are robbing a Bobcat security depot. You can get a thousand things every day. How about you make sure this is one of them? When the heist seems like a success, their getaway car gets clipped by a train. Now on foot, a sniper shoots down Brad and Michael, causing Trevor to stand his ground. Feeling overrun, Trevor makes a run for it into the foggy snow. A funeral is then held for Michael, but in the distance, Michael is seen watching his own funeral. We'll see where this leads him later on. But for now, in 2008, Nico Bella comes into Liberty City by boat to live the American dream with his cousin Roman. Unfortunately, Roman was stretching the truth with his tales, as he lives in a rundown apartment with no sports car or women. Where's Barbara with big and Stephanie who sucks like a vacuum. Nico helps his cousin with his taxi business while also saving him from loan sharks. Nico also meets a couple of friends including Lil Jacob, the head of the Jamaican mob in the city, Michelle who Nico starts a relationship with, and Brucey, an alpha male motorhead. Hit me, come on! Nico also meets Vlad, a loan shark that flirts with Roman's girlfriend Mallory. Roman is soon made aware of this when he sees his car parked outside of her place. He drowns his sorrows into a beer at his taxi business when Nico shows up. Since Nico already has suspicions of Mallory and Vlad being together, Roman calls him disloyal, but Nico will not stand for this. He and Roman go to Comrade's bar that Vlad frequents, but Vlad doesn't take his threats seriously. He tries to escape, but Nico and Roman chase him down to a broken dock. Despite Vlad's warnings, Nico shoots him in the head. As Nico disposes of the body, he tells Roman the real reason he came to Liberty City. When I was in the army, going on the mission to ambush a squad would kill a lot of innocent people. But we never did it. There were 15 of us, all boys from the village. But one of us betrayed the group. Twelve people died, three escaped. So for ten years, I've been searching for the other two. One of them leaves here. Roman tries to help Nico but is scared off by the sound of police sirens, leaving Nico to do it himself. Elsewhere, Johnny Clevis and the Lost Motorcycle Club pick up their president Billy Gray from rehab. The Lost members welcome back Billy but he's not pleased that there's a truce with their rivals, the Angels of Death. The truce was sealed by the Lost giving the AOD Billy's bike. Now he wants it back. Johnny is against this but is persuaded by Billy that the bike has true meaning to him. You and Angus built that bike for me? That's gotta stand for something. Attacking the AOD calls off the truce and the biker gang war is back on. Nico then meets Roman hiding in a trash can, but is then caught off guard by a gangster. Nico awakens tied up from across Roman, being threatened into telling the gangster who he works for. Just then, Mikael Faustin enters the room and shoots the gangster in the head for disrupting his wife's TV program. Faustin agrees to let Nico and Roman live if they pay off their debt for killing Vlad, but when untying Roman, he screams out which causes Faustin to shoot him in the stomach. Faustin's right-hand man, Dmitry Raskolov, says he'll take care of Roman and just for Nico to do his tasks. Nico also has to take out the biker that's been hanging around with Faustin's daughter. I'm gonna get the brothers and we're gonna kick your ass. Well, this biker was Jason Michaels of the Lost MC. Billy gets wind of this but tells his brothers that it was the AOD that killed Michael. So they attack their clubhouse and take their heroin as a sweetener. Nico then has to kill Lenny Petrovic, who Faustin thinks is a snitch, but Dimitri tries and fails to convince Faustin otherwise. Faustin then orders Nico to drive a truck full of explosives to Kenny Petrovic's garage to blow it up. Explosive? What the f 
Dimitri then meets with Nico, explaining that Kenny wants Nico dead for causing him misfortune. But Dimitri also explained to Kenny that Nico is just a hired gun, and if Nico is the one to kill Faustin, then he'd be spared. Dimitri also swings the deal with a cash reward. Nico confronts Faustin at the club he frequents, but he orders his men to kill Nico. Nico chases Faustin to the roof where he is executed. He then meets Dimitri at a warehouse to collect the money for the hit, along with little Jacob who doesn't trust Dimitri. Dimitri then questions Nico and introduces Wade Bulgarin. Bulgarin claims Nico sunk one of his trafficking ships and made off with his money. But what really happened is the ship sunk for unknown reasons and Nico had to swim for his life, nearly drowning. Bulgarin tries to execute him, but Nico and Jacob are able to chase them away. Nico goes to warn Roman and get him out of Hope Beach. They go to the apartment and cab depot, but find it in flames, so they just head to a place that one of Mallory's friends set up for them. Dimitri later calls Nico, insinuating he burned Nico out of Hove Beach and he'll keep tracking him down. I have burned you and your cousin out of Hove Beach. I will smoke you out of any other hiding place you have in this city. See you soon. Nico then meets Elizabeth Torres, a well-known drug dealer who has Nico watch over a drug deal for her friend Packy McCreary. Afterwards, Nico meets her again to participate in a heroin deal with Johnny and another dealer named Playboy X. The buyer is revealed to be LCPD. <laughs> How weird, man. I just want to know if you're carrying the stuff, right? You ain't right, friend. No, Come no, on, no, let's no. get out of here. LCPD! Freeze, mother I said freeze! So Nico and Playboy escape downstairs as Johnny escapes to the roof. Johnny then meets up with a local politician, Thomas Stubbs, because Billy thinks it's a good idea to have one in their pocket. He then has to save his on and off girlfriend, Ashley Butler, from drug addicts. Nico then has to steal back some cocaine for Elizabetta, but when he does, little Jacob has some shocking news for him. Michelle was actually hired to watch Nico and his crimes. You see... Nico, I have been working for the government. I'm afraid it's my job to watch you. And now I have to ask you for the coke. Nico is left heartbroken, but her employers want him to come by their offices later. Johnny, Billy, Brian, and Jim attend another heroin deal with the triads, but Johnny and Jim learn that they were the original owners. They have to escape the deal, but then witness Billy getting arrested while screaming that Johnny set him up. Johnny and Jim meet back with Brian, who doesn't trust Johnny anymore, and ends up splitting the loss into two factions. One led by Brian, who remains loyal to Billy, and one led by Johnny. Nico then does some jobs with Packy, helping out his family and other gangster, Ray Pacino. Packy then brings Nico in on a bank robbery, along with his brother, Derek and associate Michael. During the robbery, one of the hostages shoots and kills Michael, but is quickly put down. The three men then make their escape through the street, then the subway, then into a car, finally making it back to Packy's house. Back at the bank, Luis Lopez is giving a statement to the police and walks the streets to his boss's house, Antonio Gay Tony Prince. Tony is having financial problems as well as getting stiffed by Italian gangster Rocco Pelosi, who he owes money to. Tony runs two nightclubs, Mason at Nine and Hercules, but neither are giving him enough profit. Luis ends up doing favors for Rocco to pay off Tony's debt. Much to his annoyance. I'm sure I would have found that funny if I spoke spit. Johnny then meets Brian to call a truce, but instead wants to kill Johnny for his betrayal of Billy, causing a firefight between the Lost Brothers. Johnny is later able to kill Brian or spare him. Either way, Johnny becomes the sole leader of the Lost. Tony then sets up a deal to buy $2 million worth of diamonds, hoping to get out of his financial debt. Ray Bacino gets wind of this and hires Johnny and the Lost to ambush the deal. During the deal, Tony, Luis, and Tony's boyfriend, Evan Moss, notice the Lost and try to escape, with Evan taking the diamonds back to the club and Luis and Tony leaving in another car. When they escape the loss, Tony checks on Evan's bleeder page. Ordered by bikers, Ugg, 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 too young to die? They f got him! Johnny then dumps the diamonds into trash bags per race request to attract less attention. Ray then has Nico pick up the bags with some of his associates, but the triads find out about it and try to take them out. Nico outruns them and gets the team back safe, leaving the diamonds with Ray's associates to find them through the trash. Nico then meets with Michelle's, whose real name is Karen, employer. He threatens Nico to work for them or else he'll send a file of all of his crimes to the FIB. For extra persuasion, he says he might help Nico find the two men he's looking for. Nico agrees and helps ULP with their own war on terror. Welcome to America. Ray calls Nico because he thinks he either stole the diamonds or his associates did. Nico then has to track them down, kill them, and take the diamonds back to Ray. Ray finally sets up a deal for the diamonds and has Nico and Johnny go to the Libertonian Museum to sell them to the Jewish mob representatives. But before Nico leaves, he pleads to Ray that he hasn't been doing enough and wants him to find one of the men living in Liberty City. Who is he? Florian Kravich. <laughs> 
Now at the museum, the deal seems to be going fine until Luis pops through a window and shoots one of the representatives. Luis orders them not to move, but Johnny lunges for the cash as one of the reps grab the diamonds. Luis follows the rep, knocks him out, and takes the diamonds back to Tony. Nico and Johnny escape the museum with Johnny handling the cash. Nico calls Ray to tell him what happened and that Johnny has the money. But when Ray calls Johnny, he says he left it at the museum during the escape. Johnny later gets a text from Jim telling him to meet him at Ray's. Upon arriving, Ray holds Johnny at gunpoint and orders him downstairs where Jim is being tortured. During some arguing, Jim is able to free his hands and subdue Ray's goon. Jim slashes the goon's throat as Johnny and Jim make an escape. When Johnny makes it back to the clubhouse, Ashley tells him that Jim didn't make it. Jim actually died at the hands of Nico, who Ray had fined and chased down in search of the money. Luis then works for Bulgarin, thinking he'd have better opportunities doing business for him. For his last job, Luis is sent to get a package from the rooftop. Well, this contains a chef in the box, the chef that Tony bought the diamonds off of. Bulgarin tells Luis that they were originally his, and now Luis and Tony will soon pay. Johnny then meets Stubbs at the clubhouse. Stubbs informs Johnny not to worry about Pacino much longer, and that Billy is ready to testify against Johnny and the Lost to save himself. Johnny and the rest of the Lost head to Alderney State Penitentiary to infiltrate it and take out Billy. Johnny is hesitant to shoot Billy, but eventually does when he lunges at Johnny. The Lost then retreat back to the clubhouse, where some of them destroyed it. They set the clubhouse ablaze, ending the chapter of the Lost MC. Pacino gives Nico a call that he's found someone who can take him to Florian. Unfortunately, Florian changed his life after the war and thought it was either Nico or Darko Brevich that betrayed their unit. Nico leaves angrily, determined to track down Darko. One of Packy's brothers, Gerald, who's now in prison for previous crimes, has Nico kidnap Gracie Ancelotti, daughter of mob boss Giovanni Ancelotti, to lure out Tony and his diamonds. Eventually, Giovanni blames Tony for his daughter's kidnapping and he must trade the diamonds for her or else he'll be taken out. The exchange goes down at Charge Island with Nico and Packy and a tied up Gracie and Luis and Tony with a bag of diamonds. The diamonds are set in the middle of everyone, and Gracie walks to Luis and Tony, leaving on a boat. Just as Nico and Packy go to pick up the diamonds, Bogodin shows up claiming ownership, and has his goons fight the pair as one of the goons picks up the diamonds. Once they corner the goon, he ends up throwing the bag into the back of a dump truck, lost but not forgotten. Luis then meets Rocco and his uncle in the bathroom, where they tell him that the boss either wants Tony or Luis to die, but they prefer to work with Luis. Luis has to make a choice to kill Tony or have them both killed. Now at Mason at 9, Luis is ready to shoot Tony but quickly changes his mind and shoots Rocco's uncle instead. Rocco exclaims that they're finished and Russian hitmen invade the club but Luis is able to take them out. Tony loses it and heads home to leave the city since he'll be dead soon anyway. Luis goes to his apartment to stop him but Luis is adamant that Tony get a grip and take care of business. Luis takes Tony to Dukes to hide out while Luis goes to find Bulgarin and his partner Timur. Luis heads to the fun fair to destroy Bulgarin's heroin shipment and kill Timur. Luis takes a bike to the airport and jumps onto Bulgarin's moving plane. Bulgarin then comes out with a grenade thinking Luis Luis won't kill him, but Luis challenges the odds. He parachutes out of the plane and makes it back to Dutes, but not before running down a homeless man. He tells off Luis, but this man's luck changes as he finds the bag full of diamonds in the trash. Luis and Tony talk about his past and ruling the world, as Luis's friend, Yusuf Amir, shows up and offers to fund Tony's club, as the three men walk off, leaving Luis's next adventure unknown. But now Nico is helping Florian, Bernie. uh sorry, Bernie, with his personal problems, but along the way, Dimitri threatens to expose Bernie's lover, Bryce Dawkins, who's on the Family Values campaign. Maybe the best way to get the message to your boss is for me to send him your heart. Yeah, tough guy. How'd you like that? Nico kills Dimitri's goons twice and warns Bernie to stay safe. Nico then meets Jimmy Pegarino, a mob boss who's trying to get on the commission with the rest of the five families of the city. The other families are not taking Jimmy seriously and he never moves up the ranks. Nico does meet one of the bosses of the five families, John Gravelli, who is hospitalized due to his old age. Gravelli is a mutual friend of ULP and tells Nico that they are close to finding Darko. Nico goes back to Jimmy, who is paranoid since his bodyguard was wearing a wire, but Nico was able to subdue him. Oh, it looks like I messed something up. Sorry about that, Anthony. But now Jimmy is caught between taking out Ray Pacino or Phil Bell, another close associate. Pegarino ultimately chooses for Nico to take out Pacino. Afterwards, Nico gets a call from ULP that Darko is approaching Liberty City. Nico picks up Roman and they head for the airport. Darko reveals that he betrayed the unit for $1,000 to feed his drug habit. Darko is ready to be killed and Nico can choose either to kill him or spare him. But either choice leaves Nico feeling empty and unsatisfied. Pegarino calls Nico for one last favor, to do a deal with Dimitri so he can get on the commission. Nico is hesitant and calls Roman 
Roman for advice, who informs him that Dimitri is on a ship moving product. If Nico chooses to kill Dimitri, he heads to the ship and finally takes him out. The next day, Nico attends Roman and Mallory's wedding. Outside, Pecorino shows up and shoots into the crowd, hitting Kate McCreary, who Nico developed a relationship with. The following morning, Nico, Roman, and little Jacob track down Pecorino and chase him to Happiness Island. Nico taunts Jimmy and puts an end to him with a shot in the head. The old families? I know some of those guys. And they thought you were a fat joke. A joke! <laughs> if he chooses to do the deal with Dimitri, Nico and Phil head to the compound where the exchange will take place. But Dimitri calls Nico to inform him that he's killed the buyers and he should grab the money if he can. I thought, why should we hand over the age for these price? I thought it'd be easier if I just killed those guys and kept it. Angered, Nico and Phil take out the other associates and get the cash. At Roman's wedding, Nico is there alone since Kate didn't respect Nico's choice to go back on his word to work with Dimitri. Dimitri sends the hitman to kill Nico. Yes. But in the scuffle, the gun goes off and gets Roman. Nico shoots the hitman and gets out of the area. The next day, Nico and little Jacob track down Dimitri and Pegarino at a rundown warehouse. Nico witnesses Dimitri kill Pegarino and chases him to Happiness Island, where Dimitri succumbs to his bullet wounds. Welcome to America. Speak English. With either choice, Mallory is pregnant, leaving the cousins Bellic next to Venture unknown. One year later, Huang Li is arriving by plane to Liberty City. Huang is the son of a recently murdered triad boss and is tasked to deliver Yu Jian, a sword that his father won in a poker game, to be used as a family heirloom to the patriarch of the family, Wang's uncle Wu, also known as Kenny. After landing, Wang's bodyguards are assassinated and Wang is also shot but survives. The assailants steal the sword and dump his body in the water. He manages to escape and informs Kenny that the sword has been stolen. Kenny intended to give the sword to Xin Zhongming, an aging triad boss, to secure his position as his predecessor. Huang is later contacted by Zhu Ming, a high-ranking triad member, and Cheng Zhongming, Sin's son, who are also competing to take Sin's place. After doing a deal gone bad for Chan, Huang is intercepted by crooked LCPD detective Wei Heston. Heston offers an alliance to find the man who stole Yu Jian and the death of Wang's father. Heston suspects that a Korean gang allied with the triads is responsible. Heston bugs the Korean's headquarters and finds out there's a splinter group called the Wansu No Dong and determines the leader is the one who stole the sword, as well as a police informant that's been causing trouble for the triads. Sin hires Wang to find the informant only to suspect that it's actually Huang and attempted to have him killed. Kenny then shows up to convince Sin to give them time to find the real informant. Sin agrees and Wang investigates the angels of death in the Korean mob, who are both suspected to be hiding a rat. However, both are determined innocent, leading a new course of investigation. Heston instructs Wang to hack into the FIB servers where two names pop up, Zhu Ming and Cheng Zhongming. Wang informs Sin of this and he steps down, disgraced of his own son, naming Kenny as a new leader of the Liberty City Triads. Wang then executes Zhu and Chan, despite both pleading their innocence. Later, Hester reveals the information in the service was fake and there is to be a meeting between the leader of the Wansu and their allies. Heston and Wang go to the meeting and find Kenny, who admits he was responsible for the theft of Yu Jian and Wang's father's death. They chase him to Sin's place, where he explains he was ordered by Sin to retrieve the sword, which means he would have to kill Wang's father in order for it to be passed on to him. Kenny agreed, but then decided to keep Yu Jian instead of positioning himself in such dishonor, and frames Zhu and Chen to cover himself. Sin demands Kenny for the sword, which he ironically gives him as a thrust in his body. Wang and engages in battle with Kenny and eventually kills him, fulfilling his promise to avenge his father. Suddenly, the IAD and FIB storm in to make arrests, but Heston claims this bust to be his as he's said to be working undercover. Sin, being badly injured, praises Wang for his loyalty and nobility. He makes Wang the new triad boss but has no immediate answer for it. Heston then orders the arrest of everyone except Wang, stating that he is a good kid even for a rich snot. In 2013 in Los Santos, Michael Townley, now going by DeSanta, is having a session with his therapist and lets it all out. He sits on his ass all day, smoking dope and jerking off while he plays that game. If that's our standard for goodness, no wonder this country's screwed. He then takes a seat on the beach as two men ask him for directions to a house. Franklin and Lamar work as repossessors for a sleazy car salesman, Simeon Yatarian. After dropping off the vehicles, they drive to Franklin's house where he gets roasted for his yee ass haircut. Maybe you got rid of that old yee yee ass haircut you got, you get some bitches on your Oh, better yet, maybe Tanisha will call your dog ass if she ever stop with that brain surgeon the lawyer she with. Never. After a couple of more repos, Franklin gets tasked with breaking into a house to retrieve a car that's been behind on payments. After getting the car, Franklin is surprised that the owner's father, Michael, was hiding in the back seat and points a gun at him. Michael demands answers and makes him drive to the showroom and gives Franklin an ultimatum. Drive into it, right through the window, and fast. I'll put two rounds in the back of your skull and 
do it myself. Franklin gets paid and runs off while Michael stays and deals with Simeon. Michael then goes home to relax but Franklin shows up for a beer that Michael sarcastically promised. Michael feels bad for Franklin so he takes him to get a beer for real this time but his son Jimmy calls him. I mean our boat going down the western highway. It's, it's been stolen. What? The yacht's been stolen? Franklin assists Michael in saving his son, but the boat is long gone. Michael has Franklin fix his wife Amanda's car while he clears his head. Franklin and Lamar try schemes to start getting paid again, such as trying to kidnap a Bala's member who's an informant and later meeting that same Bala for a deal which is actually a setup. Michael also has his own personal problems of his kids getting into trouble and his wife cheating on him with the tennis coach. Michael and Franklin chase down the coach to a home in the hills, which Michael thinks is his home. Michael ties a winch to the support beam and brings down the house. When Michael returns home, he is confronted by Mar and Madrid whose home he destroyed. Now Michael must pay 2.5 million dollars to finance the rebuild. He only knows one way to make that kind of money and needs to make a call to an old friend. Michael visits Lester Crest, an old hacker and heist planner from back in the day. Michael needs him to help him get enough money to pay Madrazo. Lester agrees after Michael does a favor for him and they case a jewel store together. Michael also brings in Franklin as a driver on that heist. At Michael's house, he and Franklin celebrate when Dave Noren comes in. Dave is an FIB agent who helped out Michael before. He warns Michael that he knows it was him who robbed Vangelico, but Michael denies it. Even after after watching a news report about it. In Sandy Shores, Trevor is watching the same news report when he hears something familiar. You forget thousands of things every day. Make sure this is one of them. This leaves him shook, realizing that Michael might be alive after all. When he walks out of his trailer, Johnny Clevis confronts him about being with his girlfriend Ashley. Trevor is so shaken that he pays no mind to Johnny until he continues to antagonize him. Trevor mocks Johnny and ends up stomping his head in. He and his partners, Wade and Ron, go visit the Lost Brothers and chase them down to the new hangout. Trevor takes out as much as he can and then orders Wade to track down Michael Townley. Trevor and Ron then visit Ortega, the leader of the Aztecas gang. Trevor threatens him that the drugs and guns now go through his company and takes Ortega out of business. Business. To solidify his new position, Trevor tries to do business with the Triads, but the humble translator explains that they are working with the O'Neill brothers instead, Trevor's most hated rivals. Cause those f***ing O'Neill brothers, I hear a little birdie telling me that they have a bit of a problem, since one of them's gonna have to be surgically removed from the skull of the other- Trevor goes to their meth house and kills as many as he can and blows it up. Wade eventually tracks down Michael, so Trevor and him take a road trip to Los Santos, but not before taking out the rest of the Lost MC chapter. They then go to Wade's cousin's house, so they have a place to stay while in town. The next day, Michael is dealing with some family problems when Trevor walks in the door. You know, you're a real What did you just say to me? Stop it! You two, you're ruining my yoga! Somebody say yoga? The DeSanta family is caught off guard. After a small confrontation, Jimmy reveals that Tracy is auditioning for Famer's Shame, a talent slash skill show. Trevor doesn't want his niece to be humiliated, so he drags Michael along to save her. Well, it seems like they would have helped her more if they had stayed at Michael's house. The pair chase down Laszlo to the end of the river, and Trevor has an idea for a fitting revenge. Now drop it like it's hot, alright? I want to see you get nice and low. Michael makes a call to Dave, hoping he can help him once again. But Dave wants Michael to scratch his back before he scratches his. Ferdinand Karamoff. The agency claims he's dead. We at the Bureau think they're full of crap. We think he's being debriefed someplace. Michael is knocked out and awakens in a government building to find Ferdinand, but his toe tag is on a different body. Michael shoots his way out and meets Franklin to lay it all on the table. I mean, look, Franklin, I'm working for the... Vets. Michael, Trevor, and Franklin are then hired by Dave's boss, Steve Haynes, to get Ferdinand out of the IAA building for a debriefing. After rescuing him, Michael and Trevor meet Dave and Steve to interrogate Ferdinand. They suspect he's a spy for the Azerbaijanis, so Trevor torches him for information on the target Ferdinand has been helping. Once they have enough info, Michael takes the shot and completes the mission. Trevor does have a small heart though, and gets Ferdinand out of the city for a new life. You're alone now. Really? Yeah, really, now let's go. Trevor then visits Franklin, but starts hitting on his aunt. Why don't you go get yourself something nice, okay? Thank you. <laughs> it's $7. Lamar is trying to get Franklin to help him on a jail in Grove Street and Trevor invites himself but bears fruitful when Trevor notices the product isn't what it seems to be. I want a taste of the other side of the brick. Now you heard what your boy said, you're leaving. Hey, give me that, give me that back. Whoa. What the f Did we ask for a key or a f***ing ounce? Man, that's mother f***ing drywall. Hey, we got some mother f***ing buyer's remorse out here. You can't f 
Hustler, hustler! The three men have to shoot themselves out of the grove, taking down Ballas and LSPD. They then escape on jet skis courtesy of rapper MC Clip. At the same time, Michael is having more marital problems with his wife and her new yoga instructor. Michael sees something is up and tries to attack Fabian, forcing Amanda to leave with him. Michael then goes on a ride with Jimmy to pick up some marijuana and a refreshing beverage. Jimmy persuades him to take a sip and he starts hallucinating. Turns out it was laced with anesthesia that vets use. Michael trips hard monkey and alien balls, but soon snaps out of it and makes it home. He finds a note left by Amanda stating that he's out of control and Jimmy said Michael took drugs so she moved out with the kids leaving Michael all alone. The trio had to do another job for the FIB. Some of the government some of it is pretty corrupt. Stealing a file being transported in an armored truck. They prep and successfully steal the file, which Michael takes to Devin Weston, a rich douchebag. He wants Michael and his team to steal some cars for him. To sweeten the offer, he sets up a meeting with Solomon Richards, Michael's favorite movie producer. Solomon is making his last movie, Meltdown, Meltdown before production is problematic. Michael helps get back the star and director from Rocco Pelosi. The three criminals later steal four of the five cars needed for Devin. Stay in the car there, homeboy. I'll deal with you later. But the last one is put on hold when Michael is requested by Madrazo and brings along Trevor for help. They both need to take out Madrazo's cousin who is going to testify against him. After taking him out and getting the files, Trevor takes it to Madrazo for a payment. Michael dumps the sniper he used to take down the plane and waits for Trevor. Trevor didn't like the way Madrazo spoke to him and denied payment, so he stole his wife as retribution. Michael freaks out but they know they must lay low in Sandy Shores until they can work out a deal with Martin. The pair are then visited by Dave and Steve who are having a funding problem. They suspect a research lab is creating a toxic nerve gas, so they need Michael and and Trevor to accumulate enough money to fund such a heist. They call Lester and stake out a small bank to rob. After surveying it, they head back and prep for it. On the day of the heist, Michael discovers Trevor is developing a relationship with Martin's wife. She's a 60 year old housewife! Ow, she's 57! They end up putting it aside for now to focus on the robbery, along with Franklin and an accomplice. Fun fact, if you choose Packy McCreary, he speaks of the Bank of Liberty City heist, hitting at Nichols' fate. It was me, my brother Derek, God rest his soul, my pal Michael, God rest his soul, and another boy Nico who's probably dead too. The Polito Bank is a success and they take the money to the middleman, Agent Sanchez. Trevor later needs Michael's help to rob a train which always contains high valuables. Michael ultimately finds a statue which he thinks will smooth things over with Madrazo. Trevor tries to take it for himself but Michael convinces him otherwise. Wait, you give me that case, I'll give you something bigger. What? Union Depository. They later meet Steve and Dave to break into the lab facility. After an elaborate infiltration and transporting of the nerve agent, Michael gets a text that everything is fine with Madrazo as soon as Trevor brings back Patricia, which leaves him heartbroken. Trevor then has some domestic problems with cousin Floyd and his wife, Debra. And look, Debra, I love you and I love you too, Floyd. Why can't we all just be together? After some sort of confrontation that leaves Trevor with the syrup stained shirt, he and Wade take over the Vanilla Unicorn Gentlemen's Club as their new home. This club serves as the base and setup for the Union Depository gig. Big one. The big one. The, the big, big one. one! The team stake it out to look over their options and decide how to get in. Now back at Michael's house, Trevor visits to raise his spirits and talk about Brad. Trevor soon has a suspicion and realization of what really happened. Up in North Yankton, exactly who was buried in your place? I never gave it any thought. You know what I'm thinking? I have no clue. He storms out and catches a plane to North Yankton with Michael right behind him. When Michael gets to the cemetery, Trevor is almost to the coffin. He busts it open and his suspicion is proven true. Brad! Him and Michael have a standoff when suddenly Trevor notices someone. He uses this opportunity to escape and let Michael deal with him. Unfortunately, Michael is kidnapped while Trevor is almost back to Los Santos. He gets a call that it was Wei Chang's people in North Yankton, the father of the kid that wanted to work with the O'Neills. He thinks him and Michael are a couple and promises to kill him if he doesn't shut down his business, but Trevor could care less. I'm serious about this. He will die. Tell him. I love him dearly. Franklin, Lamar, and Trevor soon get the last car for Devin and take the Packer to the other side of the state. They run into police trouble but eventually deal with it. But Devin steals Franklin for payment. He then has Trevor visit him at his aunt's house to ask about Michael. Oh, my N-word, huh? <laughs> What's up, homie, huh? <laughs> when Trevor seems like he has something to do with his disappearance, Franklin calls Lester for help. Franklin uses a phone tracker to find Michael who's being swung to his death. He gets there in time to save Michael and take him home, where everything is explained to Franklin. I made a judgment call. I don't know if it was the right one. I did what I thought I had to do. I had a young family, Franklin. I was running with a crew of crazy mother with nothing to lose. I saw it out. The future for me, for my family. I took it. You took it? 
Man, you burned every mother you've ever known. It was that or die. Michael gets back to work with Solomon, and after helping him one more time, gets a surprise. Michael gets called one more time by the FIB to erase incriminating files on Steve. They articulate a plan to break into the bureau, and at the same time, Michael deletes files on himself. He then meets with Dave for a debriefing, but is interrupted by Steve who wants to arrest Michael. Then the IAA, a secret team with Sanchez and Meriwether show up for a showdown. All hell breaks loose, and Michael must escape with Dave. Trevor shows up to aid him. If anyone's gonna kill you, old friend! It's gonna be me! And they meet later to talk about the depository heist. Michael then gets his family back together after a somewhat successful therapy session. Get a center, Michael. You have no center. How about you suck my d Franklin is forced to call Michael and Trevor for help when Lamar gets set up by Stretch again. He gets him out of the sawmill and back to the hood, where Steve and Dave want a favor from Franklin. When the timing's right, you're gonna take old Trevor and put him out the pasture, homie. Now it's the night of the movie premiere, and Michael and Jimmy arrive at the Oriental Theater in style. Devin Weston also shows up, but tells Michael that his wife is probably stuck at home. Michael and Jimmy then race home to find Meriwether, trying to kill his daughter and wife. Michael then takes out the mercenaries with some help from Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, you like that, don't you, huh? Take it off! <laughs> He then gets his family out of the house and into a motel and calls Lester the next day. Michael advises that they move on the Union Depository heist quickly. He, Franklin, and Trevor then grab the necessary equipment to pull off the job. The heist is a great success after they get the gold bullion out of the city. Franklin gets a visit from Devin Weston who tells him he wants Michael taken out. Franklin is reluctant but is given three choices. Option A, call Trevor to meet up with him. Trevor thinks that he is called to talk about Michael but Franklin reveals he's actually there for him. Trevor tries to escape but Franklin is close behind. He then gets a call from Michael who is not far from their location. Michael ends up ramming Trevor into the side of his vehicle and makes him crash into an oil tanker. Trevor calls them Judas's as he's covered in gasoline where Michael takes a shot and burns up Trevor as an explosion goes off. Michael seems to be glad that Trevor is gone and Franklin takes this as an education. Choice B, Franklin calls Michael for a meetup. Michael thanks Franklin and is feeling blessed that everything is coming together but Franklin pops his bubble. Franklin tries to take a shot but Michael escapes with Franklin close behind. Michael takes off on foot into the power station and leads Franklin up to the top of the tower and after some arguing, Franklin charges Michael and pushes him over the edge. Michael yells that he took in Franklin and his family, but his hand slips and lets go of Michael, falling to his death. Franklin then leaves a voicemail for Lamar, stating how sorry he's been to him. In option C, which is the canonical ending, Franklin calls Lester to have Michael and Trevor meet him at the foundry. He and Lester come up with a plan to get Meriwether and the FIB agents there so they can take them all out. Franklin picks up Lamar on the way for a little extra help. There's some arguing between Trevor and Michael, but they put aside their differences to help Franklin. An all-out firefight ensues and the three men are victorious. They then decide to tie up some loose ends and call Lester. Franklin goes to take out Wei Chang, Michael takes out Stretch, and Trevor takes out Steve Haynes on the Ferris wheel. He then gets the location of Devin Weston's house, which is guarded by Meriwether mercenaries. But he's able to deal with them, kidnap Devin, and put him in the trunk of his car. Devin tries to bribe Trevor, but it doesn't work. He has Michael and Franklin meet him at the cliffs of the Great Ocean Highway. He unlocks the trunk and they give Devin some words of wisdom. Keep your problems the f out of America, huh? Before they roll the car off the cliff and explode on impact. They all agree to stop working together but remain friends. Ending this story of Grand Theft Auto for now. Tell you one thing, T. I'm getting too old for this nonsense. Grand Theft Auto 6 will be coming out soon and I plan to make a story video about that. I apologize for this length of the video but I hope you all understand that I had to get the details of every GTA video game out there. If you guys enjoyed this video, then don't forget to leave a like and consider subscribing for more videos in the future. My name is Heathen, thank you all for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.